All right, good morning. It's good to be back in my church again. You know, we were talking, uh, Chris and them, I said, we know we need to have an elders meeting now because I am no longer interim. And we got to put a battle plan together for this year and what we're going to be doing. And I have some ideas and some things I want to do. So uh, pray for us as we prayerfully consider all those things. I miss all my folk. I know it wasn't a good day to come to church, but I think it's a good day to be here. So I'm, I'm just glad. And the roads actually were in pretty good shape, but uh, I can't blame them for being a little scared with all that ice that came out. But anyways. And then uh, my sermon today. This came from part of my revival series. Uh, I still have a few more sermons to do with that. But this one is what I call Abiding in Christ Part 2. I have done Part 1 here. and I doubt you even remember it, but it had to do with experiencing God's power and His strength and His, his uh, um, uh, partnership and all those things that are part of abiding. And this is Part 2 because I think that abiding is an extremely important thing that we need to learn to do. And when we do that, our joy can be more full as we can go about doing the things that we, we have to do. And so there's just a lot of things we need to be uh, uh, looking at in this year and the things that are coming upon us and the, the work that we need to do for the Lord and the Bible studies that need to get started and uh, the meetings that need to be held and the dental clinic that needs to be held and all these things. But we really don't do well at any of those unless we abide in Christ. So as we start that... Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we love you so much and thank you. You're so good to us. Father, we need you now to teach us. Teach us this morning. Speak through the one who's speaking, for he's not worthy unless you do. And may we leave refreshed, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Abiding in Christ, part two. First thing he starts out, he tries to clarify something, which I think is extremely important. He says, I am the true vine. If there's a true vine, then there's a false vine. And there's lots of false vines, okay? The devil has so many... Uh, it's just like fishing. I, I used to love to fish. I don't fish much anymore, okay? Just... I, I never liked to eat fish uh, in the first place. And I certainly didn't like cleaning something I didn't like to eat. So if you actually catch it, you have to do something with it. And so, uh, and you can re you know, put it back in. But I thought, well, what's uh, the deal? You just hurt that fish, you know, so much. And then you throw him back in the water. I, I don't know. But I, I want you to think of, uh, th think of the uh, uh, true vine as, as the one that's the right one. And, and then there's lots of lures out there to get you to do other things. Does that make sense? The devil has about 19 or 20,000 fishing poles that he uses with different bait for you. And for you, it's different bait. And for you, it's different bait. For you, it's different bait. He knows what our needs are. We need to learn to find the true vine because it's important to our eternal salvation. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear what? Now, fruit isn't... Uh, one guy says, well, I've never really got to personally lead someone to a Bible study and then to a, and to a, a narration of the Lord. I've told my testimony and things like that, but I never have... And I said, that's not all the fruit there is. Now, it is part of our fruit, isn't it? That we lead someone to Jesus. How many of us should probably lead someone to Jesus this year? Every single one of you should have your hand up. It's your job, okay? <laughs> yes, one Christian we bring, as, as uh, Mark Finley says, we're, we're one beggar leading another beggar to bread, okay? And we each need to be doing that every year. That doesn't mean that you, you may not feel comfortable with Bible studies, and sometimes that's the reason we don't witness. Because the first thing they're going to ask you is, where do you go to church? And a lot of Seventh-day Adventists will go, well, you know, I'm kind of an Adventist. And they just don't say what it is. What it is, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, what does that mean? Well, we observe the Sabbath and we believe that Jesus is coming soon. That's all you really have to say. But then they say, well, I really like to know why you go to church then on the Sabbath. Then you can say, listen, I would love to have Bible study with you. Okay? Then you get to do that Bible study. If you're scared to death, come to me and I'll pray for you and still let you do that Bible study. Okay? <laughs> Because it's up to you. It's your, it's your work, right? It's for you to do. God didn't send that person to me. He sent them to 
you. Therefore, he will supply. He always does. So it's important for us to, to see that. There's fruit that should be, you should be bearing. And if you don't bear fruit, there's a problem. So let's read on. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he what? It takes away. That's a little bit of a problem, isn't it? If you're not bearing fruit, now some fruit can be just that you're overcoming some sin in your life or you're getting uh, better hab habits and attitudes, you're eating better. We are on our January, I don't know what you would call it, resolution again. <laughs> And, and it's up to, and actually we've done really well on some Januaries, and some Januaries we haven't done quite as well. But I, I, I really want to do well this time, okay? Uh, it's going to help me because I personally have some health things to overcome, and it will make me feel better, okay? And so uh, uh, last year I actually lost 30 pounds. I gained 40, but I, gained, I lost 30, so it was good. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every bra branch that bears fruit, he what? Yeah, so if you're, if you're actually walking in the Lord, with the Lord, expect him to prune you. Now, what do you do when you prune a bush? You actually cut some parts off. Sometimes you, you, you lower it and start all over again, or you take off some branches. I know when we do tomatoes, and my wife grew up, she was, a, she was ADD before it was cool, okay? <laughs> really, she was. She was, she was a, you know, she, and, and when she gets to cut, I have to tell her, whoa, whoa, stop. There won't be a branch left on this tomato plant if you keep cutting them all off. We well, have to get them so far above. I said, yeah, this far above, not this far above, you know? But she does that, and it's amazing how it starts growing, and those things that are left start really sprouting out, okay? She, she knows what she's doing. God knows what he does with us. If we're actually bearing fruit, he says, I want you to bear what? More fruit. So therefore, I'm going to prune you. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to discipline you. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may what? What's the reason? Bear more fruit. Exactly. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. I'm not talking about whether you're saved or not. He's trying to tell them. You're already clean. I got that part done. But you need to learn to abide in me after you're clean. Amen? you got to learn what that means every day to be a part of Jesus Christ. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Very, very, and I did this in the last sermon. I'll do it again just quickly. If I take my vine off my ivy plant, we have some really nice ivy plants that are finally starting to grow. Our house, I've always told you, is the killing fields for plants. In fact, when I bring a plant in the house, it grabs the door like this. No, no, come in here. And people are real sweet. Oh, by the way, thank you, for church. Don't know who was responsible for it all, but thank you, church, for sending my wife flowers. And uh, she was very happy to get them. And she still looks like she has to go smell them again and things like that and see what I should do. And she had... <sighs> Uh, people have been asking, and it wasn't a hidden thing, I just don't want really to put everything out there, but she had sinus surgery, she had collapsing sinuses, had trouble breathing uh, through her nose and stuff, and they went in and, I don't know a better way to put it, uh, Bill, they roto-rooted her, okay? <laughs> I can just see it with a drill or so. I don't know what they use. But anyway, she had to go and get all this scraped out and put in new cartilage in here. She got a nose job virtually is what it was. But she got new cartilage inside so that her opening is no longer collapsing. It's open. She can breathe. But she's really been struggling with infection after it. And uh, she had a sore throat from the vent too that went down. That lasted for a long time. And then she was still, and now she's just not feeling well. She worked all last week. And of course, you can't pick up a lot until this starts healing. And so it was hard for her at school, and she'd forget and pick up something. She'd just been miserable all week. So remember her in your prayers, please, if you will. Just happen to think about that. I want you to remember her. But neither can you unless you abide in me. It's important, <clears throat> as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, that it must be attached to whatever it is that's necessary to bear fruit. Now, I'll give you an example. I can have this great, wonderful light of sorts up here, and it's got wonderful, it's got a stand on it, and it really lights up really well. And I stretch out the cord and I lay it next to the wall. And I come up here and do click, and there's nothing, right? Click. What's the problem? It's not plugged in. What's amazing is once you go to the, to the source, guess what happens? 
Mm, it comes on. Jesus says you can't produce fruit unless you're plugged in. So you can sit there and look good as a Christian. You can want to be, be a wonderful looking Christian, but until you plug into Christ, you cannot bear fruit of yourself. There's nothing there that you have to be able to do that. But if you're plugged into the source, which starts feeding you, right, the necessary things to produce fruit, then you suddenly produce fruit. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. He goes over it again. Now, when, when Jesus or God, when he repeats himself, you should listen. There's usually a reason for that. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. It's, 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 it's reciprocal. Bears a little bit of fruit. What is it? I couldn't hear you. Much fruit. We're to bear what? Are you bearing much fruit? Don't answer that. You may say, well, I don't, know. I don't, I don't want you feeling guilty. I want you to examine yourself. Amen? Says, but let a man examine himself or a woman. The idea is, if that's the, 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 if that's the factor in my life, if I'm not overcoming something or walking better in something or making some improvement somewhere, I must not be... Plugged in, connected, All right? Exactly. So he says that. I, he who abides in me and I in him, remember you've got be, you to be connected to the, right, to the right vine, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. So there's really not a whole lot of in between. It is as we grow and we'll get better with it. I got that. But there's really no in between. You're usually producing nothing, right? Or you're producing a lot. The closer I get to Jesus, the better I do in my personal life. The closer I get to Jesus, the better I help in others to find Christ. When I am actively seeking and finding God, I have a purpose then in my life to tell someone else about it. Whether it's how he helped me out of this debt or this thing or this illness or this sickness. Or whether it's how that uh, the car kept running even though it should have been out of gas. Happened. I was not going to stop on the Sabbath. And I had forgotten Friday night to get gas. And I still had to make my trip. And I have no clue to this day how I made it all the way home. Still Sabbath. Not going to buy fuel until the next day when I got in. I went, okay, Lord, we're still not there. <laughs> we went and we bought gas and we got there. And I have never put that much gasoline in my car before. I said, I didn't know it held that much. Way below the, I mean, the light came on long before I should have gotten able to get home. It's less to the gas station. Those are things we should talk about. That's things that are fruit in your life that you're getting to see that someone else needs to know. And it's discouraging, I know, when we're not getting healed. And it's discouraging, I know, when you're not able to accomplish the things you want to accomplish. I know it's discouraging when you have sins in your life you just can't seem to get past. But don't give up. Abide because the more you abide, the more power you take, the more change that happens in your life. It's a fact. It's why he's telling us here, abiding, what it means. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast away as a branch and is what? Withered. This is not good. And they gather them and throw them where? Where? And they are burned. If you're not connected to Jesus, you will not make it. This is, he's trying to tell you, part of the plan of salvation. One, you accept the fact that he died on the cross for your sins and that your sins are now forgiven. Two, I must abide in him or I will lose that ability to be saved. Why? Because I'm suddenly abiding in some other vine. There is no in-betweens. Any vine other than Christ that you're plugged into can cause you death spiritually. And you know that. My son William. I, I give this testimony not for him to be embarrassed ever. 
I do it because I see the problems that other people have. I live with those problems worrying about my son. My son's an online gamer. He has his social structure from people with weird names. You know, they got those weird names they, they use on, online when they're playing games. Killer Boy and so-and-so and, -so and Big Sarge. And he was telling me some of the, his best friends. I said, have you ever seen any of these people? Oh, no. Do you talk to them? Yeah, while we're playing. I have the microphone thing. My son is turning 30 years old. And Christ has given him this bait, this false vine. That's where his friendships are. That's where he spends his money, lots of it, on. And folks, I'm not saying that to demoralize or, or say anything against him. I'm saying that you have those false vines in your life too. And Christ says you can't be abiding in them because if you do, you'll eventually what? Die. Spiritually. As well as physically. And the devil don't care which one it is. I have my bridge club. I had one lady say, I love my bridge club. We play bridge every week. Without fail. That's where all my friends are. I said, good, good. Said, That's a great place to introduce them to Jesus. He said, oh, we don't talk about stuff like that. Not when we're playing bridge. Sounds like she's got a what? Some bait. Satan, oh, play bridge. Here. Bridge in itself wrong? No, no, I'm not talking about What it does, it takes the place of you connecting where? It takes time away from who? Jesus Christ. This is important. This is salvation he's talking about here. If you are not abiding in him, he doesn't say that it has to be the, most, the best situation of abiding. We're not perfect yet, are we? I know y'all aren't, but you know, I, I, no. I understand that. I'm not either. That's not the deal. But if you're abiding, you keep getting more of that, 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 that good stuff from Jesus so that you start growing and then you produce fruit in your own life and then you produce fruit in other people's lives by them accepting Jesus also. You see what I'm saying? Amen. And you can be, you can be, if you're not careful and not even notice it, you're attached to the wrong vine. And it's whether they gather them, they throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. How does that work? How does it work? Let me tell you how it works. As you abide in Christ, he changes your mind. Therefore, I'm starting to ask for things that he can give me. Does that make sense? When I'm not ab abiding in Christ, right, I have my mind on other things which are not good for me, and if I go to him and ask for them, I don't receive. So that doesn't work, Pastor Harvey. It does. As you abide in him, your mind changes and you start asking for good things. Like my grandson. My grandson has about, I don't know, somewhere in the area of about 27 or 28 chapters of the Bible memorized. He can spout them off to you like this. And he said, you know, Papa, he says, I've been praying, and I happen to know this, so guess what he got for Christmas. But I've been praying that the Lord would give me a new Bible set by audio so that I can, when I go to bed now I can just listen to them. And of course... I said, forget it. You don't need that. No. <laughs> I was joyful. Brought it for him. Yes, that's what he got for Christmas. <laughs> and a brand new player. <laughs> yeah, it was neat. I said, yeah, you, you bet. Whatever you need. You know, so he, he, he puts it on his computer, and of course he comes down to one of these little thingy bobbers, and you know, and you stick it in it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But anyway, it's pretty cool. And he, I mean, I sat there and I said, oh, come on. I opened up the scripture. And he was just word for word, New King James. Sorry for your King James, but he likes the New King. But he went through and he gave me word for word, most of it Daniel. And part of it, most of it, the rest of it was in Revelation. 
He's already preached already. He's seven years old, guys. <laughs> but see, when he starts asking for things because his mind has changed, then he gets them. Does that make sense? Jesus says, there's a lot of things I want to give you, but I can't give you your desire if you're not connected to who? Connected to me. But this, my Father is, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. He, he's glorified in the fact that you are indeed connected to Christ. In that, then you'll bear much fruit. So you, and then that shows you that you are one of his, what? Disciples. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Another clear statement. Do you believe that? I do too. Can't ignore them. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Oops. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. And what comes out of abiding in Christ? That your joy may be full. You see, he says, this is, a, this is something you do that has benefits. I want to give you real joy. Not temporarily, I'm on the, playing my games. And I win a game, and I'm like, ah, and then all of a sudden I lose a game. Oh, I mean, no, he says, I want to give you something that works, that lasts. Because kids don't believe they're the ones getting hooked on these games, folks. I, I, mean, I, am, I'm, I messed up. I came from the era of Pong. Does anybody remember Pong? What it was was a little ball goes... And I thought that was wonderful. Then Nintendo and there was Atari came out. You know, my, I memorized the Pac-Man pattern. <laughs> I had always had, all you could get was nine lives ahead. I always had nine lives ahead. Could never get me. I knew how to, I had this so cool. And then I taught my son. Whose fault is his game problem right now? And it's a real deal, guys. There's something I want to bring to our church. I'm getting it. I'm buying it. It's called Media on the Brain. There are real dangers. Our kids, I didn't believe it either. God, I, I went through that. And me and God had a long talk with each other. I didn't know that these things were actually the very things that were Satan's bait. You know, and the kids, they say, ah, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, I do that. It didn't hurt anything. It just doesn't hurt anything. And I'm fine. And I always believe that. My son does too. And now he is virtually a hermit. He goes and he works. Comes home. Cooks him something to eat. Sets down at his computer. And there he goes. Until it's time to go to work nearly. Gets very little sleep. This is real. But folks, there can be other things. You, start, you look into your own life. Are there things that you spend more time on than you do with Jesus? Whew. See? So let's talk about abiding. Now you can tell I have one, two, three, four, five letters to get through. I'll go through as quickly as I can. Acknowledgement. First part of abiding is acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. I am the what? He, we make him the only vine. I don't need any other vines. Amen? No. I just need one. And it needs to be the right vine, the true vine. It needs to be Christ. I need to acknowledge that. C.S. Lewis is writing in a book called Mere Christianity. No, he's not an Adventist. I got that. So Jesus was either a madman, a liar, a, a myth, or he really was and is the Son of God. I must learn to acknowledge finally that he has supremacy over me. He has supremacy over my games. He has supremacy over my job. He has supremacy over my cars. I remember going up in high school, we didn't have stuff like the kids have today. We had cars. And we, we souped them up and we put chrome wheels on them. And oh my, that was the thing. 
Of course, now they're called classics. <laughs> I'm getting very old, very old. It's bad when my car costs now ten times more than it did when I bought it in the first place. It's a classic. Boss 302, 1970 model car. I just kept souping up. Every bit of money that I had, I put into it. Put in Mickey Thompson street slicks on the back with wide wheels and chrome. Had the, the smaller, the, the, the boss has his own set of, of chrome wheels that they, they had for that 70 model. I had it on the front with, with the raised letter tires, you know. And I had to go from, from just having a 650 pumping uh, uh, carburetor. Anybody remember what a carburetor is? <laughs> to an 850 dual pumper. It would pump the gas. I know because I went through it. Yeah, four barrel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're right, Bill. <laughs> and and, and, and my, my greatest desire was to get from here to the next gas station. <laughs> but at 50 cents a gallon. <laughs> But I filled my life with that. It was my, it was my consuming. I get a little extra money. I, I wanted to put something else on. I put hooker headers on it because it opens up up where you can breathe more. That's the pipes that go out of your engine. And I had it where you could actually you you pull. And this was neat. The guy that did put it down, put it on for me. I, I didn't know how to do that part. He, he, you could actually take it and you would turn a switch and pull, and it would actually take your hooker headers offline, and you had no mufflers. Suddenly you're going. I was like, yeah. Then the cops would come by. You put them back on real quick. <laughs> You need mufflers. So you don't get in trouble. But see, I, I put my life into that. That was important to me. It drew me away from who? From any relationship with Jesus. That's why I lost my relationship with him, even though I had accepted him at 12 and preached at 15. By 18, I was gone. Because something else took the place. We must decide whether he truly is the Son of God. If he is what he deserves, our time. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You don't have another vine. Amen? Got one. And he didn't say, I am a way. I am a truth. And I am a life. He said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Acknowledgement. First, we must acknowledge who he is in order to learn to abide. The second, we must learn to what? Bond. My dad's injury. He was in the, he was in the oil fields. He, he had worked himself up to a, a place of, of supervising the whole drilling super. He was called a tool pusher. I don't know if you know what that means. But he was, and he was in charge of that. Anyway, the, sometimes when they would go in and out of the hole drilling, right? They would take the drill pipe and put it all down in and take it back out. Sometimes they would be ready to set that case in for that size, and they were fixing to go to a smaller drill pipe. So they have to lay down all that drill pipe they'd used, right? One piece at a time. So to do that, they'd bring it up, unscrew it, bring it over, slide it down a ramp, and then you'd take it from the ramp, it'd slide right on out, and then you'd roll it across on some, some pipe racks. All right? That's why you did it. And one time when he was standing at the bottom, he was watching what they were doing, he was talking to somebody, he heard this big scream, hey! And all he saw was this drill pipe coming at him. And it had gotten loose. It was coming not down the slide the way it was supposed to. And as he dove underneath a, a platform that was right there, the, you climb up steps to this platform, then up to the, to the top of the rig floor, it caught him on the backside of this leg right here. And when he turned over, his leg didn't. He knew he was in trouble, he said, from that point on. Of course, they quickly held his leg together as best they could, put him in a car, drove him, because they're out in the, the rig, drilling rig out in the middle of nowhere, and they drove him to the hospital. And the doctor said, we're probably going to have to amputate your leg a little above this break. My dad said, no, 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 don't do that. I said, let's try it at least. Let's see if you can put it back together a little bit. He says, no way. He says, it's all in splinters. Little pieces of bone. It's all that's there. And he says, well, I'm not going to lose my leg. If I do, well, I'll go down fighting. And he said, well, we'll try to see if we can put it together. Now, this was back in 1960. 
I forget, sometime when I was still in high school. And so they, 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 they opened it up. They tried their best to band it as they could, putting pieces together, closing it back off, putting some, some rods. He had some screws and stuff. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? And, the, and then, and then they, they, they put a cast on him, okay? And, and then he said, he said, he said, we'll just see. We'll just see. And we prayed. I was still young enough to... I was listening listen to the Lord, and about, he was in that. He was in cast and had other surgeries, probably for almost nine months. And luckily, he was well, well loved by the people he worked for, and they never cut a check. They just kept him, kept paying him his check. He would answer questions, of course, and calls and things like that. But I mean, he he didn't get to go out anywhere. And so finally, all those bones and pieces, believe it or not, and I don't know how they did it, Bill, you'd have to tell me, became one piece of bone again. Taking it and melting it back together to make it what? One. They broke both, you know, both of them came back as one. And until he died, he was walking like you and me. Miracle. But the idea is those bones can come back together and they can become what? One. What does God want with us? He wants us to become what? One. Even from our splintered lives of sin, he says, come back. I can, can take that all and put it back together and make it one in me. But there's no power any other place. You can't find it any other place. You can't have another vine. You can't get healed. You can't be made one again until you come to me. I think this is exactly what happens to us when we bond with Jesus. He is the vine. We are the branches. We are bonded into his vine. We are bonded into Jesus. And we become what? One by miracle. When we bond with Jesus, we abide in Jesus. There's no more, there is, a, there is no more than can, boy, what did I write there? <laughs> we abide in Jesus, there is, there's more than one connection. No, no, there's more than connection. Oh, I got it. There's more than connection, more than association. Well, I'll tell you what, it's bad when you can't read your own script. <laughs> but we abide in Jesus. There, there, there's more than just a connection. I got it, Harvey, finally. There's more than just what? Association. I can associate with a group of people and not know any of them. Truth? Yep, I can walk through the room with them. Yep, I've done that. People don't know it, but I'm kind of a shrinking violet sometimes. People say, yeah, you, yeah. You know, I mean, I had to come out of my shell some to be a pastor, but, but when I get into a room sometimes, I just kind of just slide off the back of the room. I'm good. I'm good. I'm all right. Yeah. How, you, how you doing? Good. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I never really associated with any of them, although I was there in the same what? Room. You can come to church all you want, but you don't learn to abide from just coming to church. You learn by praying and asking Him to come into your life and to change you. Lord, there are things wrong with me. And we don't want to face that. But I say if you do, you're going to be better off. Because He wants to abide with you. He loves you. It's important. When we bond with Jesus, when we abide in Jesus, there's more than just connection and association. There's oneness. There's something what? Sacred and, and holy that is experienced. There's, there's a simplicity, a harmony, a unity that can only be experienced where? In Jesus. He says, I want you to want me. <laughs> I want you to love me. Jesus is looking for someone to love him the way he loves us. And he virtually begs for it. He gave his life for it. Then he asked you, won't you come to me, please? Won't you, won't you put away these things that are taking you away from me, please? Won't you abide with me? I'll abide with you. I'll stop all heaven and come and make sure I can abide with you. I will do whatever it takes. That's why I sent my Holy Spirit. 
Are you taking that time with him? He invites us to bond our hearts, our minds, our spirits with his. And some people say, well, that's just too much of a sacrifice. Or, Pastor, it's just too much. I got other things I want to do. For eternity, we'll be doing this. You better get used to it if you want to be there. Acknowledgement, bonding, and then there's the image. God, so God created man in his own what? Image, and in that image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Wow. He says, I didn't just make you out of Play-Doh. <laughs> It is make you something. I made you in what? My image. Unfortunately, through Adam's transgression and sin, death has come into our world. It has marred the image of God in every one of us. But abiding says, I can make that image over again. I can make you back into my image. I can restore you into my image. If you just give me time. In Jesus, in abiding in Jesus, that image is restored. It's not something that we're able to do for ourselves. Without me, you can do nothing. You can't do it. I was watching a wonderful deal on, uh, on the, which channel was it on? Because I flipped it back and forth. I think it was on the, the, the Amazing Facts channel this morning. I think it was. It may have been 3ABN, one of those others, because I switched back and forth on some programs when I, was, when I was getting breakfast ready. But it showed the potter. And I've been to a potter, and we've had a, a sermon on the potter. I'm not going to go through that. But it was amazing. He had a potter there, and he was talking, and, he, he, and that's, how he, that's how he gives his witness, okay? He sits in front of the potter when he starts talking about God. And he starts making this thing. He says, and God sometimes has to bear down on us a little because we're not pliable, you know. And he says, but then he'll add his Holy Spirit and he would put more water on that clay. He'd add his Holy Spirit and he would make it easier to mold. And before he got through, he had this wonderful, wonderful piece of pottery that he was showing. It was beautiful. I don't know how you do that. I never could do that, you know. I say that, people say, yes, you could if you wanted to. <laughs> well, I guess I don't want to. But anyway, it's, you know, it's one of those deals where, you, where you, I don't know how you do that. But he says, first thing I have to do, if it's kind of a, a piece of clay that looks like this, you know, because he hasn't got it all. You know, he says, the first thing I have to do is I just keep spinning it, keep molding it until it's centered. He says, Jesus wants to mold you and center you in, the, in his ways. It's important. That you allow him to be able to do that because we cannot do the clay cannot mold itself. But through abiding in Christ, we are remade, reborn, born from above into the image of God that we were created to possess. In Jesus, we're redeemed, restored, and made new. Amen? Amen. Acknowledgement, bonding, image, and discipline. Well, this is the part. I don't want to lose you now. I don't want you to get too tired on me. I only got a couple of letters left, okay? Abiding in Christ means that I am invited to live a life of, of discipline. Abiding in Christ means that I am invited to live a life of discipline. Uh, I like that, that, that other gospel. You know, the one I can just say yes to Jesus and do anything I want after that. <laughs> yeah, it's not the good news. It can't be gospel. No, Geist invites us to find a life of discipline. In other words, he'll keep changing our minds so that we go, you know what, I want to do better. I want to change. I want to be a part of this better. I want, to, I want, I want Christ to, to, to mold me and to make me. And he starts doing it. John, 1 John 3, 24 says, Now he who keeps his commandments abides where? In his love and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit in whom he has given us. He says, I know you are mine because you're starting to find discipline in your life. 
You're listening to me. You're listening to my Holy Spirit say, don't do this anymore, okay? And no, I know you may occasionally fail. I got it. But we, we start all over again that same day, three times a day if you have to. But you just say, I can do this, Lord. I can be with you. I can walk with you. And when I stumble and fall, praise God, there's one there to pick me up. Amen? And others who pray. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening dis discipline seems to be joyful for the present. <laughs> but what? Yeah. I mean, I, I can't remember a spanking I enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> or that trip to the, to the belt drawer to get that belt. To have to take it back to him. I, oh, boy. I mean, uh, you can't even do that nowadays from what I understand. You know, without getting in trouble. But I didn't know it wasn't. I didn't go, oh, boy, that was such a wonderful discipline. <laughs> no. But out of it came a better behaved kid, one who respected adults, didn't use bad language. I mean, just, you know, just amazing stuff. It was good. I had fruit from it. No, it wasn't joyful, but it was painful during it. But nevertheless, after it yields the peaceable fruit of what? Righteousness to those who have been what? Trained. God will start training you as you abide. You're going to find yourself changing. Yes, you will. And then he'll say, you know, I need you to change here and now here and now here. And, it, and I think for eternity, we're going to be learning to abide and learning to live better in his will. Abiding in Christ means we come under His discipleship, under His discipline. It means that we allow Him to prune the areas of our lives that are what? Unfruitful and what? Harmful. He says, yeah, I submit to you, Christ, and I trust you. Do with me as you see fit until I get where you want me to go. And we're afraid to do that because we're afraid He might just do that. <laughs> Deal with us. But thank God He's a loving, kind God who deals with us in ways we'd never think of to change us. Will we grow into the image of Jesus? Will we produce the fruit of holiness in our lives without disciplines and pruning? No. It happens because we need it. Acknowledgement, bond, image, discipline, and the last one. Good, the pastor is getting through. Everlasting. Abiding in Christ here helps us to learn to abide with Him how long? Forever. The beauty of abiding in Christ is it never, 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 never ends. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I get to abide with my God who created me forever in a joyful place that I'll never have no more pain or suffering. In a place I'll never see death again where there'll always be good temperatures and never any more snow and ice. <laughs> Or 110 degree weather. <laughs> We're such complainers. I mean, you know, I'll come into someone and they'll say, oh, I like hot weather. Or they'll say, I like cold weather. I said, you're weird. I just like it somewhere in between, you know, where it's just comfortable all the time. You know, Florida maybe here. Sometimes Texas. The, the beauty of, behiding, of abiding in Christ is that it never ends. How do we get there? How do we learn to abide? Where do we go? Read it with me out loud, please. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will... Where do you go to abide? To Christ. And he says, I know you're, you've tried to do things on your own, and you couldn't, because without me you can do what? So lay down your, your burdens. Let me have them. Then I'm going to give you mine, which you can perform. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, biting. For I am gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find what? Rest. For my yoke is, and my burden is, light. Yeah. Truly. By acknowledging him, by bonding by letting him conform and restore the image, by submitting to his discipline, you get everlasting peace and rest. Amen. Amen. Want to learn to abide? That's what we do. Father in heaven, boy, we
we love you. And I know that there's things that we need to change in our lives. And Father, it's hard to stop doing those things. They seem so good and joyful for the short time. But Father, teach us. Forgive us when we grab those other vines and take time away from you. Forgive us when we let them take our control of our lives. Father, help us. Whatever our problems may be, whatever things are taking their place where you should be, Father, forgive us, but Father, help us now. We, we come to you and we lay the burden of trying to get past them to you, and then you give us your burden, which is easy and light, in which we can enjoy for eternity. We love you. Thank you so much for making this all possible by sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you so much for desiring to come and go through all you did and not giving up. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us and abiding with us. We love you. Before I close, I just want to, I'm not going to ask you to come up front, but I'm going to ask you if you would, if you just keep your heads and, and, and heads bowed and your eyes closed. <coughs> Maybe you're struggling in this whole abiding thing, and tell you what, yours is on the list with us. But you just like to know there's something maybe in your life that's been taking the place of God. It really has. You spent more time doing it than you did anything else. So just raise your hand and just say, Pastor, pray for me. I won't do anything else. Just, yes, amen. God bless you. Yes, amen. Amen. Bless you. Anyone else this morning? Anyone else this morning? Father in heaven, you've seen the hands that are raised. You know our needs. And you know the things that uh, we struggle so hard with. Father, Father we, we don't want to be burdened with them anymore. We want to give them to you. And we want to pick up your, your burden, which is light and easy. It teach us to abide now and to put those things in behind us. Father, we can't just, just immediately turn them loose because they're hard to turn loose. But Father, right now, please... We want to do right. So we give them to you, Father, and ask that you please give us courage and strength to walk in your will and not do them, but to give more time to you to read and to pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hearing our prayer and for the answer that we know is one you want to give us so we can be sure of the outcome. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. Amen.